When we left off in Sahara Special, Miss Pointy gave all the students a notebook. And what are they supposed to do in their notebook? Yeah, write down their life, kind of. Thanks, Ava. Uh, it's a journal, right? It's a journal entry. And she had a couple stipulations on it. That's a fancy way of saying that they could do something to make make it known that she could either read it or she wouldn't read it. What did they have to put on there? What did they put on there? Something like, oh, something like to get to, so she can get to know him or something. Yeah, there was something that they were going to write at the top of the page, though. Go ahead. Uh, a P with a circle around it with a line through it. Yeah, P with a line through it, like a P circled with a line through it. That means it's none of your business, Miss Pointy. Uh, so that circle with a line through is what they put at the top of the journals. Some of the things that the other kids wrote. Uh, I like recess. My big sister's going to have a baby. I want a GameCube for my birthday. I want a pet in my building, but it's no dogs allowed, not even cats. Taco Day is the best in the lunchroom. So based, like, stuff that you would see from most kids. What does Sahara write on her journal? Courtney? She writes down, I am a writer. And what was Miss Pointy's response to that? Miss Pot, Palate. Go ahead, Con, uh, Bryson. What did, what did Miss Pointy write? I believe in you. I believe you. So she writes, I'm a writer. And Miss Pointy responds with, I believe you. Is that what Sahara, is that the message Sahara has heard her whole life? No. No, I, I would say no. I think that's a fair assessment. Folks, if you have the volume on your computers, could you make sure you turn that down? I don't mind if you're working on your flag assignment, but if you would, make sure the volume is turned off. If you're just playing games on there, please X out of that. Close your computer down. We're going to do our read aloud now. This is chapter six. You don't want to miss this one. This one and the next one are probably my two favorite chapters in this whole book. Chapter six, the lion's lesson. Miss Pointy is, well, pointy. Her nose is pointy, her ears are pointy, her shoes are pointy, and boy, her fingers are her fingers ever pointy. Sometimes even her voice is pointy, especially when she says you. The you she's usually talking to is Daryl Sykes. Daryl Sykes always has fire in his eyes. Anything Miss Pointy tells him, he looks at her like she just told him she ran over his dog. He makes these grunting sounds and talks under his breath until Miss Pointy can't ignore it anymore. She takes him out into the hall. She thinks we can't hear, but we're real quiet then, so we can. She says things like, I can't make you do anything. It's your choice. Please help me. When she's not too frustrated, but when she's mad, she says things. Keep talking to yourself like that in a crazy way. You're going to end up in a crazy, a crazy man sitting at the back of the public bus with dead pigeons in your hefty bag. How's that sound? I hear Daryl say nothing, and I feel mixed up. I know that angry feeling of grown-ups trying to push their way into the room of your mind, and I know that feeling of trying to hold the door shut against them with quiet and looking down. But I knew why I was angry at my teachers, at my counselor. I don't know why ang why Daryl's angry at everybody. <clears throat> Miss Pointy tries to get us to leave our problems at home. She stands at the doorway every morning smiling like she's auditioning to be a movie star. But she blocks the door and nobody gets in until they use the trouble basket. We pretend to put our troubles into this big green basket she holds out before we enter. Our troubles are invisible to the eye, but whew, they are heavy. She practically breaks her back holding all those troubles for us, but she says we can't carry them into the classroom ourselves or we won't be able to work. She offers the trouble back to us at the end of the day since they don't belong to her. Nobody's ever taken them back. Still, they seem to follow us and find us home like black cats. In class, Miss Pointy ignores Daryl's special needs. She calls on him in the same as everyone else. She waits a long time for him to answer. And then we all have to wait. Daryl, Daryl, I'm waiting on you. Silence. I don't know is an acceptable answer. How about I don't care, he sneered. As a class, we all made a low moan. Let me hear that low moan. Uh, less acceptable, Miss Pointy said and continued to wait. And wait, and wait. S 
stupid, Miss Pointy. Daryl grumbled back. Yes, Daryl? You have something to say now that your turn is over? Miss Pointy grumbled back. You call me Beryl! Yelled Daryl. Some boys snorted through their nose because Daryl is kind of round and solid barrel shaped. He crossed his arms and pouted. I certainly didn't call you Beryl, Daryl. Why would I call you Beryl? She sighed. Please stop talking that crazy talk. You always call me crazy! You're always acting crazy, she roared back. And then Daryl got up to Miss Pointy's desk and... Sorry. Then Daryl got up, kicked Miss Pointy's desk, and sat back down, his chest heaving. I would have been afraid. Miss Pointy looked unhappy, but not afraid. She got up, stood next to Daryl's desk. It, excuse me, she said. And then she kicked his desk firmly with her toe. He jumped. Huh. Did kicking a desk work for you? It's not working for me. You're not kicking it hard enough, Daryl said sweetly. Hmm. She nodded. I see. Would you mind getting up? And Daryl stood. She shooed him a few paces away. She picked up the hem of her long ballroom skirt just slightly before punting the desk. Boom! So mightily that it tipped over with a terrific crash and slid about three feet. We just stared. Ouch, Miss Pointy said. She took her foot out of her high-heeled shoe and rubbed her toe, and then she hobbled back to her own desk. Well, it still doesn't work for me. Well, thanks anyway, Daryl or Beryl or Farrell or whatever it is you want people to call you. Now, let's get back to work. Daryl Beryl was too pig-headed to go and get his desk, so he had to do his work on his lap. When we came back from lunch, the desk was set straight again. The point of this story is, don't try to out crazy a crazy. You see, even Miss Pointy's stories have points. She likes to tell stories about foxes and crows a lot. Crows putting pebbles in jugs and making the cool water rise. Foxes snapping sharp jaws at grapes just out of reach, walking away, not caring. Dogs losing bones to reflections in the stream. Ants working, grasshoppers playing. She told us the story about a fox in a stork. The fox invo invites the stork for dinner but serves food in a flat saucer so the stork can't eat. The stork invites the fox to dinner and for revenge, serves food in a narrow neck jar so the fox can't eat. What's the lesson here, she asked. Foxes and storks don't know how to eat dinner, said Leon. Man, fox should have just ate stork, Angelina observed. Maybe he was still full, suggested Michael. When people aren't nice, everyone ends up hungry and suffering, Ernie said. Hmm. That's a good one. Miss Pointy rubbed her chin. No, it ain't, argued Leon. There's no people. They're just foxes and storks. When you go to someone else's house, sometimes they don't serve what you like, offered Mariah. Yeah, I slept over at Veronica's, and her mama served government cheese, said Sakaya. Veronica turned around and sent Sakaya a stabbing look. Well, she did. Man, girl, your mouth is about as big as a saucer, Raphael laughed. Come on, Miss Pointy, tell us, what's the lesson? Tit for tat, said Miss Pointy. This sent Raphael and some of the boys into such uncontrollable giggles that she sent them out of the room one at a time to the water fountain. Man, that story nasty, Miss Pointy, said Dominique upon his return. I didn't make up these stories, you know. Aesop did. Well, why you always write about animals, demanded Kiari. Kiari, didn't he know no people? He was writing about people. He gave the animals the qualities he saw in people. Bitterness, perseverance, foolishness, trickery, pride, but Aesop had certain qualities too that made it so he had to tell stories for survival. He was a slave to King Xanthus in ancient Greece. He was mute because he couldn't talk. He was ugly. They said he had a humped back and bow leg, pop belly, and he was as short as a door. Dang, that is ugly, Tadesia agreed. The Greek gods looked upon him and didn't just see what was on the outside. They saw that he was decent on the inside, so they gave him the gifts of speech and storytelling. You think those were good gifts? Man, I'd rather be handsome, Larry admitted. Would you have known Aesop was ugly if I hadn't told you? No, we shook our heads. He writes handsome stories, said Rashonda. I think so, too. He used his stories to advise the king. Sometimes he disagreed with the king's way of thinking, but he couldn't say so outright. So get, or guess what? Man, they'd kill him, we all cheered. Off with his head, Sakaya shouted. You gotta watch the man, said Dominique. 
Miss Pointy did not argue. Instead of disagreeing with the king, he used his stories to offer a bit of common sense that the king might have been missing. Maybe he used animals so the story wouldn't seem so personal. Yeah, they tricked him, Ernie said. Persuaded, Miss Pointy winked. Then she told us a fable she said was one of her favorites about a lion trapped in a net who was chewed out to freedom by a little mouse. Have you heard that story before? Yes, I lion and the mouse? Cool. She asked what the story showed. Uh, be careful of traps, whether you're a mouse or a lion, Ernie said. That's a good piece of advice for a king, said Miss Pointy, nodding. <laughs> or if you're a mouse or, or a lion, Ernie said emphatically. Man, you gotta watch out for the man, suggested Dominique. Uh, perhaps, Miss Pointy said, but please try to think of a new lesson, Dominique. That was not the moral of all of Aesop's fables. Dominique slumped down into his seat, blushing. I'm just saying, he muttered. Y'all better watch him. Hey, that's your daddy's moral, not Aesop's, laughed Tanasia. Hey, you be quiet about my daddy, Dominique said. Now, now, stay on business. What's the lesson of the story? Uh, payback favors, said Amir. Good, said Miss Pointy, smiling. Anyone else? It doesn't matter if someone is different. They can be your friend and help you when you need it most, said Paris. She was smart. Miss Pointy took out her happy box, a box full of little stickers that she takes out sometimes if you impress her. We moaned, jealous. Paris is right. No one is so weak that on occasion he can't be a help to you. That's what Aesop meant, so that Xanthus wouldn't, shouldn't overlook the smaller countries in efforts to make alliances, explained Miss Pointy. What's alliances? Friendships. If there's a conflict, a war, you need all the friends you can get. If you're in a war, we'll be your allies. Ernie spoke for all of us. Well, almost all of us. Daryl had been quiet, burning his look into Miss Pointy's forehead all along, silently crushing his teeth against the inside, against each other inside of his mouth. I could see his jaw moving. I'll be counting on it, said Miss Pointy. Now, let's write in our journals. I imagine what Daryl would write. Later, I was able to see, because it was my turn to check in, on the homework, check in the homework on the chart. I stayed after a while with Rachel and peeked while Miss Pointy took the rest of the class outside. I don't think you should look in other people's journals, said Rachel. It's just one person's, I promise, I said. Whose? Daryl's. <laughs> Daryl's? You're crazy. He probably can't even write. Come on, you want to see? She leaned over but then pulled back. No, she said. Curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> what a way to die, I thought. Did Aesop say that? No, your mama did. Get in trouble by yourself, cuz. I'd like to get out of the fifth grade. She went back to cleaning the board in wide, wet lines with a sponge, and I read. Here's what Daryl's journal entry said. It says, P with a line through it. She a bitch. A big one. Why she go and say that I ain't never said nothing to her? I'm gonna tell my mama. Then we'll see. Well, I wasn't too far off. What did it say, she asked. I thought curiosity killed the cat. You were right, I said. It was nothing.